Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Alara Stefaniuk Cadet. My pronouns are they, them, and I have the great privilege of being your service leader this morning. I will be joined virtually by our minister, Reverend Rosemary, and our musician this morning is Karen Mills. Thank you to all of our wonderful volunteers who help make our time together possible and beautiful. Whether in person or in line, you are welcome here with us this morning. Before we begin our service, I'd like to call up a few folks for some announcements. If you would like an announcement to be in our Sunday services, please make sure to speak with the service leader before the service. We have four announcements this morning. Um, Audrey Brooks, would you like to come up and do our first announcement, please? All right. We're using this mic right here. I just wanted to uh, have a moment of your time to clarify what I'm hearing are the most wonderful and unusual rumors. And um, I guess we could start a soap opera over what's been happening in this church in its transition. Now, I have to say this, because of my age and infirmity and having been in this church for over 30 years, I think that uh, transitions are difficult and they were difficult for me. And because of that, uh, our new minister and I happen to have locked horns. I'm using that in a euphemistic way. And I want to assure everybody that I'm not um, running away from the church. I needed a break. She needed a break. We're going to get together and sort stuff out as to who does what, why, where, and when. So I just want to bring that to your attention because uh, when Mike and other people were telling me uh, some of these stories, I thought, oh, wow, uh, that's alien planet stuff. So let me clarify that. I love this church. I won't leave it. Neither is Rosemary. We're strong women. We lock horns. It's normal. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Uh, Oksana Atwood, you have an announcement for us this morning, too. Good morning. Uh, just two small th uh, things. First is we have a board in the back that we've put up uh, with uh, our question today. What is something that used to scare you but doesn't scare you now? And we'd encourage people who are online to also put in their responses as well. And the second thing is we had planned a trip to the Mutart Conservatory next Sunday, but we have such a big celebration with Ruth's lunch uh, that we're just going to postpone that until next month. Um, we are going to do a series of kind of spiritual exploration field trips where we're going to the Mutart Conservatory or the Art Gallery and hopefully the Devonian Gardens as well. So please stay posted and we'll be starting that back up next month. Thank you. Thanks, Oksana. That sounds great. Uh, next, I've got Susan Lynch on my list. Thanks, Alara. Uh, my name is Susan Lynch, and one of the things that I do uh, is I am a producer of live plays, live theater. Uh, most of the plays that I've produced have been written by David Hawes, who's also a member that many of you will know. And we are thankfully now going to be going back to live stage. We uh, did Zoom play readings during the pandemic. So in the before times, we were doing live stage and some of you have been to some of the plays here. So I'm pleased to announce that we have a live stage performance coming up. Save the date, April the 28th in the evening. The play is called Park Bench with View. And it is, it is a mystery uh, and to find out the ending, of course, you have to come to the play. But I am soliciting volunteers to help on the night of the play. And it would be things like um, collecting tickets at the door, uh, helping people find seats, it's, it's that kind of thing. Uh, so if you would like to join in on the hilarity and fun, uh, I've got sign-up sheets that I'll be bringing for the next several weeks to see if I can round up a few volunteers to help out. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I noticed a hand in the audience for one more announcement. 
I will allow it, but I'm reminding everyone we're supposed to know before the service. So come on. Okay. Well, we know we're we're working the on next it. Next time. It's n it's we're we're working on we're working on that habit. It's all good. We're Hi. in practice. My name is Ellen Logan. Um, I'm just reminding you that next Sunday we're having a lovely hundredth birthday celebration for Ruth Patrick. Woo! And yes, it's going to be a, a lovely celebration with food and a program, and you're all invited. I have a sign-up sheet at the back for food donations, main course, salad, or extras like a cheese plate, fruit, whatever you wish. So if you would please sign up and contribute to our wonderful celebration. We'll, we'd really appreciate it, and you're all invited. See you next Sunday. Yes? Do you bring our food that morning, or do you bring it? No, you bring it that morning. If you're bringing hot food, bring it in a crock pot or ready to go into the oven. So see you next Sunday. Great. Thanks, Ellen. That was important. I appreciate that. Karen is our last announcement this morning. Good morning, everybody. Well, two weeks from now on Saturday, March 25th, we are going to turn this area into a happening cabaret. And uh, we'll have some small tables and snacks and a cash bar and Coriolis will sing. And we also have two amazing musicians as guest artists, Caleb Nelson, who is a local singer-songwriter and owns a recording studio in town, is going to be singing and playing, uh, probably guitar and piano. And then we also are really lucky to have Dana Wiley, who is a local folk singer, songwriter, uh, drama producer and actor, and has just released a new album that's being called one of the best folk albums of the year already. So we happened to book her just before her album came out, and. Uh, yeah, we're, we're feeling pretty lucky about that. So I have tickets today. They're $20 each if you'd like to snap some up. Uh, we're also in need of a few volunteers. So if you could help either with setup or taking tickets or at the cash bar or snack bar, come and talk to me too. I'll just be at the back at the end of the service. Thanks, Karen. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritual questing, individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives. And so, as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet your devices and yourselves so that we can all enjoy the service. We gratefully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 land, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures have been here since time immemorial and continue to influence our vibrant communities. Land acknowledgements are a beginning, an invitation to deepen in our work and a connection. I have been privileged to deepen in this work by developing relationships with some of the elders within our communities in particular, our CUC elder in residence, Sharon Jinker Bra Jinkerson Brass, who is a beautiful, beautiful soul. And one of the things that she has taught me in our connection and relationship is that an important piece for reconciliation and for spirit to come through is that we loosen our gripped grips on our scripts. So. In the spirit of vulnerability today, that will be one of the themes. You may see that our title this morning is Sacred Scripts, question mark. So in the spirit of loosening our grip on our scripts, I would like to offer great thanks 
to the land on which we are gathered, to the first peoples who are the tree nation, for those that fly, those that crawl, and those that swim in the sea, and for the four-legged and two-legged peoples of this land all together in relationship. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. We begin with a time of contemplation and music with a prelude, Forgotten Dreams by Leroy Anderson, played by Karen Mills. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to invite Declan up to do our chalice lighting this morning. Our words are by Brene Brown. Vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage aren't always comfortable, but they're never weakness. Now, if you'll join me once our chalice is lit, I'll just wait. Thanks, Declan. You'll join me in body or in spirit to sing hymn number 391, Voice Still and Small, and you may rise if you wish. At the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, we are a self-sustaining community. The time of gathering our offertory is a time where we can share our gifts of abundance with each other. There are many ways we share our gifts with each other, our presence, our volunteer time. Even just showing up is an important gift. But for those of us where a financial gift is feasible, this is a time where we can gather that. 
Our charity of the month this month is our International Women's Convocation, and half of our unmarked donations go towards that charity. Um, now is the time you can bring forward those offertory plates. Thanks, folks. While you're being so generous, I want to talk about our annual canvas. Uh, our annual canvas is uh, when we go each year to ask everybody what their intentions are for contributions for the coming year. Now, if you're a member of this church, we require you to return a pledge form. If you're a member, you should be pledging. And basically, you tell us what you think you will be contributing in the coming year. I take that and I put that into the budget every year. So if I don't know what your intentions are, I can't, I have trouble preparing my budget. I'm actually in the process of putting the budget together right now. I hope to do it this afternoon and report it to the board here this coming uh, week. But I won't know what our contributions will be for our budget until Canvas is completed, which is at the end of this month. So between now and March, 31st, uh, two Sundays from now, uh, I would like everybody to complete a pledge. You could find a pledge form for those who donated in the past year. I will have mailed a pledge form along with a thank you letter to everyone and their tax receipt. Uh, if you didn't get one of those, there's pledge forms at the back of the sanctuary here, and there's pledge forms in the lobby by the, uh, the, the uh, canvas. Um, uh, there's a poster in the lobby that, that has pledge forms on it as well. So there's pledge forms available. It's just your name, how much you think you can uh, contribute next year, and how you think you would pay that. And there, um, thank you, uh, she has them at the back if anybody would like one. Um, fill out the pledge form, it's just those two questions. Put it in the collection plate, uh, drop it to me afterwards. <clears throat> um, and that way, I can put together the budget and we can see whether we can afford all the wonderful things that we want to do next year uh, because a lot of people have asked for a lot of new things, uh, a lot of expensive things, and uh, we have to see whether we can actually afford that and that's what I use as the pledge forms to actually say this is what we can do, this is what we can pay for. All right, so thank you. Um, please complete your pledge form by the end of the month, and uh, we will talk to you then. Now, let's, uh, as part of our sharing of our abundance, let's move on to sing From You I Receive. time for all ages this morning, I invited a very special friend of mine to join us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, 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 my name is Spruce. My pronouns are E and Erm, E like the letter and Erm like. Sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know what our pronouns are, but mine are E and Erm. Thanks for that introduction, Spruce. How are you doing today? Can I be honest? Yeah, of course, we're with friends. Well, I'm gonna say a brave thing. Sure. I'm feeling a little bit nervous this morning because, because, because I haven't been in person to tell a story in a really long time. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and there's a lot of people I don't know out there. I hear ya. Well, I'm happy to be here, though I really do love making new friends. So I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm also a little bit excited. And sometimes it's hard to know what all of those feelings are all at once because they come all together. I totally understand, Spruce. I really appreciate that you came to chat with us today and to show our friends that you're willing to come and show up even when you're feeling nervous. Yeah. I, I do really love coming to share stories with my friends. And did you know that our monthly theme this month is vulnerability, so that you being brave 
today with your story and being honest about how you're feeling nervous is actually really on theme. I didn't know that. I just, I always show up and tell what's true in my heart. And so I guess that just happened to work out today. <laughs> I hear you, Spruce. Thanks for coming and sharing with us all of those vulnerable places in your heart. Do you think you might come back even though it's nerve wracking? I think I might if it's okay with everybody. We'll see. But I definitely want to make new friends when I'm here even though it's a new place and there's lots of new faces. I think, I think I might be too nervous to say much else today, but I'll be back. Thank you, Spruce. I appreciate you coming. That's our time for all ages, folks. <laughs> our introduction to Spruce the squirrel, who is a very special squirrel. So for our service leader reflection this morning, I'd like to reflect a little bit more about what I mentioned in our land acknowledgement. My friend, Elder Sharon, and I have talked at great lengths about how sometimes the scripts that we hold in our lives can get in the way of our spirit moving through. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, I guess that means I can't use a script today. And with the theme being vulnerability. Um, but in thinking about it, I realized that the scripts in our lives aren't just about what we write on a piece of paper and read in front of each other. It's also the scripts that live in our heads and in our hearts. And there's a lot to that. So I was thinking about that and thinking about how, what are the things that get in the way of my own vulnerability and can block the flow of spirit in my life? And there's lots of things, and they're certainly not all things that are written down. Sometimes when friends come for comfort, I offer advice. And advice can be a script, even though it's not a word-for-word -word script. That can still be a script that gets in the way of that vulnerable space. So I was just thinking about that and reflecting on that and thinking about how hard it is and important at the same time in order to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to be able to see those cycles in our lives, see those pieces in our minds that sometimes are less conscious, but that play out in our relationships and can block those tender, vulnerable places that can come up in relationships. So, in that spirit, I would request that the lights be dimmed, and I would invite you to plant your feet firmly on the floor. And if it's comfortable for you to do so, I would invite you to close your eyes. I know it's not comfortable for everyone, and that's okay too. But if it feels safe, I would invite you to close your eyes. And I would invite you to notice your breath. The word breath comes from the Latin for spirit. So, even if we're only looking at it from a semantic point of view, when we notice our breath, we are noticing our spirit in some way. So I invite you to notice your breath and just see where it goes in your body. When you feel your breath, is it more in your chest? Is it more in your belly? Can you feel it in your back? Where does your spirit move you, literally, within your body? And then, as you're noticing where your breath is, I invite you to go a little deeper and see if you can feel your heart beating. If you want to put your hand on your chest, that can help. But I invite you to feel that heartbeat.
one of the ways that we can move out of our scripts, out of our thinking minds, is by feeling into our bodies. And it's something that we have to be intentional about because it's not something that otherwise we need to do. But in this moment, I invite you to feel into your body, feel into that heart bite, heartbeat, see where that breath is. And then, if it feels safe to do so, ask yourself very gently, what is something in your own life that you feel vulnerable about? And I invite you just to pull that piece of vulnerability into that heartbeat space. How does that tender vulnerability work with the rhythm of your life, the rhythm of your heartbeat? And how does it live out in the world? Because all of the things that are in the rhythms of our lives are also in the world in some way. We bring them into the world. And when we allow those vulnerable, tender places into the world, we create space for spirit. We create breathing space for each other. So how does that vulnerable, tender place that you're holding in your heart right now live out in the world? I just invite you to breathe into that for a few breaths. And then, when you're really feeling that space, I invite you to come back to where that breath is in the body. Maybe start to notice your hands and feet. Notice how the ground holds your feet on the floor. And then, come back into the room and we will sing our next hymn together. Thank you. We take some time to recognize the joys and sorrows that touch our lives. In a ritual practiced by many Unitarian Universalist congregations and communities, we light candles to mark these significant moments and events of our lives. This morning, I invite you to contemplate that tender place in your own heart and light a candle to honor it. For those of us who are with us online, you may, if you wish, write down your thoughts using the chat in the Zoom. 
And for those in the sanctuary, I ask that you line up single file to light one of the candles and then use the glass of water to extinguish your taper. I invite anyone who wishes to do so to come forward now and light a candle for whatever that place in your heart brought you to. May the light of these candles be a reminder that even the most tender spaces inside us are lights for the world. We're now going to have a message from our newly settled minister, Reverend Rosemary. Good morning, everyone. Good my morning. name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this Unitarian Church of Edmonton. This month, we are talking about vulnerability, and I would like to thank the many people who have made themselves vulnerable this morning to put on this service. Also to you, thank you for being here, either in person, on YouTube in the future, or on Zoom, as I will be watching myself on Sunday morning. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge that your service leader, Alara Stefanik Gaudet, wanted to make themselves vulnerable and design this service. The choices for hymns and readings were all made by them. Thank you so much, Alara. It is such good practice and theology to have more voices, more choices coming from the pulpit. Having others create and serve allows for a depth of spirit that wouldn't happen otherwise. This has been a big week for UCE. You went through a process to decide if you were ready for settled ministry. The question of who, in my mind, was secondary. The big questions, where is UCE at? What do they see for their future? Are they ready to begin realizing their potential and live into their vision? 
The secondary question is, am I, Rosemary, the right leader to lead this amazing congregation? The vote last week suggested that you believe you are and that you wish to have me as your leader. I have taken the week to discern what the right course of action is, and I am very pleased that the vote was positive, and I will be discussing next steps with the ministerial transition team and with the board and the Committee on Shared Ministry. How lucky we are that we have made this time to become vulnerable together and think about what the future holds. Conversations such as these will require, as Brene Brown points out, a wild heart, a strong back, and a soft front. And before I begin, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the Ministerial Transition Team. They have put in a lot of time, energy, and expertise into this process. Thank you so very much. Now, my first quote this morning is from Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown. She says, many of us armor armor up as an as many of us armor up uh, early as a way to protect ourselves as children once we grow into adults we start to realize that the armor is preventing us from growing into our gifts and ourself just like we can strengthen our courage muscle for a stronger back by examining our need to be perfect and please others at the expense of our own life we can exercise the vulnerability muscle that allows us to soften and stay open rather than attack and defend. This means getting comfortable with vulnerability. Most of the time we approach life with an armored front for two reasons. We're not comfortable with our emotions and we equate vulnerability with weakness and or number two our experiences of trauma have taught us that vulnerability is actually dangerous violence and oppression have made our soft front a liability and we struggle to find a place emotionally and physically safe enough to be vulnerable the definition of vulnerability is uncertainty risk and emotional exposure but vulnerability is not weakness it's our most accurate measure of courage when our barrier is our is our belief about vulnerability the question becomes are we willing to show up and be seen when we can't control the outcome? When the barrier to vulnerability is about safety, the question becomes, are we willing to create courageous spaces so that we can be fully seen? A soft and open front is not being weak. It's being brave. It's being the wilderness. I'd like to also share a few excerpts from how to lead when you don't know when you how to lead when you don't know where you're going by Reverend Dr. Susan Beaumont. The subtitle is Leading in a Liminal Season. A liminal organization needs to unlearn old, old behaviors, challenge the status quo, experiment, take risks and learn. Liminal seasons are challenging, disorienting, and unsettling. Liminal seasons are also exciting and innovative. The promise of a new beginning unleashes creative energy, potential, and passion. All truly great innovations are incubated in liminality. Love's greatest work occurs in liminal space. 
All significant transactional, pardon me, all significant transitional experiences follow a predictable three part process. Something comes to an end. There is an in between season marked by disorientation, disidentification, and disengagement. Finally, and often after a very long and painful struggle, something new emerges. The natural human response is to resist liminality and to strive backward to the old familiar identity or forward to the unknown identity. The ambiguity and disorientation are at times so heightened that the very work required to move forward becomes impossible to engage. She quotes one of my favorites, Richard Rohr. All transformation takes place in liminal space. We have to allow ourselves to be drawn out of business as usual and remain patiently on the threshold, which is limen in Latin, where we are betwixt and between the familiar and the completely unknown. There alone is our old world left behind, while we are not yet sure of the new existence. That's a good space where genuine newness can begin. Richard Rohr says, get there often and stay as long as you can by whatever means possible. It's the realm where spirit can best get at us because our false certitudes are finally out of the way. This is the sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed. If we don't encounter liminal space in our lives, we start idealizing normalcy. Threshold is the universe's waiting room. Here we are taught openness and patience as we come to expect an appointment with the divine. End of quotes. We are indeed in a special time here at UCE. We are in that time of living in two worlds, one foot on each side of a threshold or limen in Latin. You might be asking yourself, why does she think UCE is in a liminal time? And what in the world does that have to do with vulnerability? Our soul matters theme of the month. Here's what I'm thinking. UCE had a settled minister for 22 years, the Reverend Brian Kiley. He retired three years ago now. Then, well, COVID. Then, an interim minister. Then, a contract minister, me. Oh, and I forgot, you were laid lead for like how many months? Six months? Eight months? That's a lot. And so, and now your relationship with me is changing. I would say that if there ever was a case for liminality, this is it. We are here together in two worlds. And in my humble opinion, the world is at our feet. We get to decide what systems we wish to keep. What needs to change? How does it need to change? Or does anything actually need to change? And the big question, how will the change from contract minister to settled minister impact UCE as an institution, ourselves personally and spiritually, and our relationships to one another? As usual, I have a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. However, I won't leave you empty. I do have five suggestions of how to navigate this very vulnerable and very liminal time. My first off thought was we need to stay open. Have a soft front, as Brene Brown says. 
If we navigate the unknown with a curious stance, with wonderment, with kindness, and allowing good intentions to permeate our psyche, we will come out the other end very healthy. My second guidepost, have a wild heart. Richard Rohr is clear about this time being so important. Much is at work here. Who do we want to be? What kind of impact do we want to have on the world? on Edmonton, on Queen Mary Park. Now is the time we can do wild imaginings. We are neither what we were and are not yet what we are going to be. The singer-songwriter Carrie New Newcomer named one of her songs, The Beautiful Not Yet. She says or writes lyrically, do you see? Do you see? Do you see it? Take a breath. Oh, the restlessness, the beautiful, not yet. There's a stirring, there's a sweetness at the edge of in between. I feel it nearly trembling, the restlessness, the quickening, the almost, but not yet. I believe strongly that we are at the brink of the beautiful, but not quite yet. Number three, all of us need all of us to make it. This is a quote from my colleague, Teresa Soto. All I have to offer you is my life experiences, my accumulated knowledge, my ability to figure things out, along with my presence. It's all you've got, too. I can't cross this threshold on my own. Each person can't cross this threshold on their own, either. We have our humanity and our humility to get this work done. And what we have is enough. Together we have more life experience, more understanding of liminal space, more ability, more kindness, more love than we need to figure this out. Allowing ourselves to be vulnerable enough to engage in the process, to say what's on our hearts and minds, and to roll up our sleeves metaphorically, spiritually, and literally. All of that is what is needed to get both feet over the threshold. The fourth thing on the list of how to get through this liminal time is letting go. And this might be the hardest one. Some of us, including me, will need to say, okay, I can let go of that idea or that way of doing things or control over this or that process. We need to be aware that during this time of transition, the mantra, this is how we've always done it, will actually keep us on the wrong side of the threshold. Now, before you get nervous, or maybe you already are, I'm not saying that my desire is to turn everything on its head. It is not. My desire is for UCE to begin imagining what amazing places you want to go, or as Dr. Seuss would say, oh, the places you'll go. How do you want to be in the world? What does your ideal congregation look like, feel like, sound like, behave like? And number five, num number five, five the, fifth the fifth guidepost, guidepost I have, I have for, for us, us is living, living into covenant. covenant. This, is this is last, and probably, and probably the, most the most important, important, important part of creating, creating beloved, beloved community, community and, and achieving, achieving our goals. goals. We, need we need to take, to take our, covenant our covenant seriously. seriously. 
And part of getting through the threshold is to begin the task of completing the other parts of our covenant that ask us to be accountable. The second part of covenant is creating a process when we fall out of covenant with someone and outlining the steps to get back into covenant. And the third part of covenant is creating a disruptive persons policy. There's lots of examples in the world for these documents, and so the wheel is pretty much already made. So um, the governance implementation team uh, will be working on these things. Why is living in covenant so important, you may ask? Well, if a congregation is not a place where people can feel safe, where rumors are allowed to swirl around and cause damage, and where a person can't find resolution, that congregation will never be a place well where wild hearts will flourish. Folks will be guarded, hearts will hurt, and vulnerability will be vanquished. So here we are, on the threshold of possibilities, on the threshold of a new relationship between us, and on the threshold of creating a healthy and beloved community. Let's go over those five things once more. Keep an open heart and mind. Have wild imaginings. We've all we've got, and that means we have everything. Let things go, systems, ideas, habits, anything that is no longer serving UCE. Live into our covenant. This is not an option. I know that I am biased. I know I have big ideas and dreams, and I know that my faith is not misplaced. I have faith in UCE, and I am very excited to work hard and with you to create the best UCE possible. So may it be. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn for this morning, number 354, We Laugh, We Cry.
I'm going to invite is Declan still in the room? Yes, excellent. I'm going to invite Declan up to extinguish our chalice. Our closing words this morning are by Stephen Russell. Vulnerability is the only authentic state. Being vulnerable means being open for wounding, but also for pleasure. Being open to the wounds of life means also being open to the bounty and beauty. Don't mask or deny your vulnerability. It's your greatest asset. Be vulnerable. Quake and shake in your boots with it. The new goodness that is coming to you in the form of people, situations, and things, they can only come to you when you are vulnerable. May you have the courage of an open heart to bring love to this work. May you hold space for the vulnerability of your own being to make all spaces sacred. And may our unscripted selves create a welcoming world this day and in the days to come. Blessed be and amen. We can rise in body or in spirit and carry the flame.